Hey folks, I know I am just an old guy telling stories, but please leave a like and subscribe before we start. Let's enjoy in today's stories. An old friend's been emailing me about a strange secret website on the deep web. Sometimes I find it hard to believe that I've been an internet and deep web user for 20 years now. That's older than some of my coworkers. It's over half my life. And still the internet feels like the new thing. I take it for granted like we all do. But at least I remember what it was like when it wasn't there. When you had to leaf through an encyclopedia set to find an answer. When you could only find Gillian Anderson's picture in magazines. Or later when songs took 30 minutes to download and full-length movies were almost impossible to find because no one's hard drive could hold them. First getting online was super exciting. I mean, the first time I did it without supervision. Because I knew I had anything at my fingertips, I could type it into good old Lycos and there it would be. I was interested in naked celebrities and the paranormal back then. I was only 13, give me a break. I was so interested in the paranormal, I built a Fortune Cities homepage and linked it to the Darknet web ring, where all the best dark websites and homepages came together. Pages on spellbooks, goth babes, the occult, dark art, and a gross out page or two. It was through the web ring that I met Angelica. Angelica hosted a Wiccan GeoCities or Tripod homepage that I found particularly alluring. No, wait, it was Angel Fire. She just made the best of some cool animated GIFs, middies, and frames. Amazing stuff at the time. Just like her, the page was creative and attractive, but also simple. The reason I bring her up is she contacted me just a few weeks ago by email, asking, What's been happening? A catch-up question. And this is pure Angelica. She signed the email with her ICQ contact, Allies. I enjoyed the quaint touch. It'd be like someone in the 90s sending a letter with a wax seal, right? I replied back with a summary of how my life had gone over the past 18 years or so, since I'd last communicated with her. 18 years, makes you think. She shot back a response almost immediately asking for details. We exchanged a few emails this way. I was pretty excited to come home from work and write to her, actually. Nothing romantic. It was just like reconnecting with my past. It was a strange feeling. But I started to notice something off. She never really answered anything about herself. She ignored my suggestions that we text or even talk on the phone. She just kept wanting to know more about me. It got me wondering if something was wrong, like she's dying and just doesn't want to say. So I just ask her why she isn't sharing and if there's something I should know. I read over her previous messages looking for clues, I guess you could say. And I noticed something that didn't occur to me at all until then. Her email address was at globetrotter.net. I know a lot of people still have their old email addresses that they just haven't given up. It just struck me as strange. Globetrotter was a Canadian ISP way back in the mid-90s. I didn't even realize they still hosted. It's like she was purposely trying to be old school. But something about it creeped me out. Like she was trying too hard to make me feel nostalgic or something. It's hard to explain. Again, I didn't have to wait long for her reply. She didn't tell me what was wrong. She just asked me, Hey, do you remember the hole? I didn't. Just a hazy sense that I dreamed about something called the hole once. Whatever it was, I had an instinctive feeling that it was something bad. I went over IRC rooms, websites, and news groups in my head, but nothing. She sent me another email before I could even reply. You really don't remember? The hole was our little secret. Not many knew about it. Even fewer how to find it, but we found it. It was right there all along. Sometimes when you'd load Darknet in Netscape, there'd be a tiny black dot in the bottom left corner in all this blank space. You had to hover over it exactly and click it. Then you'd be there. You'd be in the hole. You remember it now, don't you? She was right, I did. I didn't remember ever calling it the hole but I remembered that secret little space we found. I remember it was like the browser didn't see it as a real website or something. There wasn't even an address to copy and paste from the bar. It was just the letter M. I tried everything to pin it down to an IP, but M was all I could ever find. I remembered it, but I never liked that site at all. There was nothing there. It was all empty. 
I remembered being excited the first time we found it because it was something hidden and it felt like somewhere we shouldn't be. And then I hated it because it was just empty and it made me feel bad and empty. I never cared to remember it. I wrote Angelica back telling her this. I didn't hear back from her that night. That was unusual. She normally replied right away, eerily fast, like she already had her answer typed out and it didn't matter what I actually said to her. But now I was waiting for a response because this whole thing had me inexplicably shaken up. So of course, she doesn't reply. The next day, when I got home from work, an email was waiting. She said that we were missing so much. The hole had so much in it to discover, so many secrets, you could just keep going and going. It was like an endless puzzle. Everyone else stopped at the first layer, but she felt there had to be something else in it, that no one would create and hide this thing for no reason. And she kept looking until she discovered how to go deeper, and she kept going. She said, it's still there to find if I want to go looking. The web ring is gone, Netscape is gone, but the hole is still there. I felt a strange chill down my spine that I brushed off as nerves. I was up for a promotion and a little stressed after all. Then I started to wonder if she was pranking me, but Angelica wasn't really a humorous girl. She'd laugh at your jokes, but she didn't really make her own and I just felt she was completely serious. In fact, something about her earnestness was really disturbing. I didn't reply to her right then. I decided to run some checks on her because things just weren't adding up. I started with her email address to see if she'd been posting anywhere. I was searching for a while before I hit something. I didn't find any forum posts or websites or anything like that. What I found was that her email host, Globetrotter, had stopped hosting 11 years ago. The email address she was writing from was impossible. Why would she go through so much trouble to create a fake email address that mirrored whatever email address she would have been using in the 90s? That wasn't just quaint anymore, that was crazy. I was really worried about her, but at the same time I was worried for myself. I was never all that close to her, I mean we hadn't talked in 18 years, why did she suddenly want to reach out to me? And why just to talk about some long forgotten website? Because I felt like that's what she was building up to all along. It's just so weird, I kept digging around. I used her ICQ number, her name, the state I believed she lived in, I could find no record of her doing anything after her Angel Fire homepage. No Facebook, no Google+, not even a MySpace. It's like her last presence on the internet actually was in the 90s. It's possible to take nostalgia too far. I tried not to think about it. By this point, I'd gone a week without sending her an email or her sending me one. I felt guilty about it, but I had every right. I was losing sleep over this. I just knew I'd regret it if I sent her another email, and it seemed like she took the hint at first. But a new email came in, telling me how she thought she was coming to the center of the hole. But you could spend your whole life in here. I remember those words exactly, because they unsettled me. A week after that, I got a different kind of email. This one didn't even have an email address. That was spooky enough in itself. But then the text just read, if you get an email from anyone saying there's someone, delete it and forget what you read. It wasn't signed. I figured it had to be Angelica, but it was so vague. I was really getting nervous. I thought about getting the police involved, but I knew they couldn't do anything. I received another email with instructions of where to go looking for the hole a place on archive.org on their Wayback Machine still had the dot to click on. I thought about going to check it, but the honest truth is I was afraid to check it. Something was just wrong with this whole situation. The another email came from the blank email address. The body was just the link to a gopher site. Now, I hadn't seen a gopher site in a good 15 years. I had to download an old browser just to access it. If you weren't around at the time, Gopher Sites just housed a bunch of text files and folders. You'd go to Gopher, just blah, blah, dot com. They were usually run by universities. This particular Gopher site only had a few files. They had different file names, but all the files said the same thing. 
Help me please, over and over. I did get the police involved this time. They were courteous, but they thought I was being pranked. I asked them if they could at least look into Angelica. I told them all I knew about her. They said they'd try. I stopped received emails from Angelica and the blank address after that. I hoped it was over. I think a month passed before anything else happened. I got a large manila envelope in the mail. No return address. I hesitated to open it, but I did. And inside was a print out of all my correspondence with Angelica. Not just the new stuff, even emails I'd written her back in the 90s. I barely remembered them, but I recognized my old email address and the things I said sounded like teen me. The only thing not in there were the emails from the blank address. I took the stack of papers to the police to tell them something's definitely up. They told me they still thought it was a sick prank. I asked them why sick, because that seemed strong. That's when they told me they heard back from her local PD. Angelica's been a missing person since 1999. Her parents offered a reward and everything, but there weren't any clues. One night she was in her room, listening to music on the computer. In the morning, she was gone. I was so shocked I had to sit down. I had to side with the police that this was a prank now. But at the same time, what if it was her? Maybe she's had a psychotic break or something. Or what else could it be? What's this stuff about the hole? Is it even real? And about about the blank email address? I haven't a clue. And that's what scares the crap out of me about this. After my last post, I decided to go looking for any contacts I could remember from the time when I was speaking to Angelica, anyone who would have known both me and her. We had a few mutual contacts, mostly people from the web ring, but also people we introduced to each other. Just not many I remembered by their real names, actually none it turns out. But I recalled one friend who went by the handle Rapskellian42. He was an odd guy into hacking and anarchy, the good, clean internet taboos we had back then. He'd been on the net forever since the days of bulletin board systems. That guy, if he was still around, he'd probably still be going by his same username. So I got to searching. Not only could I not find any trace of a Rapshellian 42, I couldn't find any Rapshellian at all. That guy was all over the web in the day. So that was weird. That's when I got the idea to go dig out my old computer. It was an old 1997 HP running Windows 98. I had it stashed in the basement since I went to college. It would at least have all of my old contacts stored just where I left them. I waited five minutes for it to boot up, got the ethernet cable plugged in, and she was ready. It was like it had just been in sleep mode for two decades. And there they were, my desktop icons for IRC, ICQ, Netscape, and even Napster. Napster. I learned there was more to music than the radio from Napster. Some good memories. Anyway, I honestly wasn't sure ICQ would load. I know ICQ still exists in some form, but I just doubted their servers would still accommodate the old software. One of the key features of ICQ that made it so ahead of its time was that, besides being the only instant messenger, it also allowed offline messaging. I mention that because not only did ICQ load, but it loaded with an offline message. That perturbed me a little, because it's like it was just waiting for me, knowing I'd boot it up. Except for one detail. The message was dated from November 1999. It was from Angelica, so it had to have been sent right before she disappeared. It just said, you coming? I went cold. Even weirder is that I know I'd been on ICQ after November 1999. I'd say I used it up to 2001 or so. That's when I went to college. It's like the message got trapped in the server all that time and I was only getting it now. That gave it an even more ghostly feel. I closed the message and looked for Rapskellian42. I was hoping just to find an email address on his ICQ info. I really didn't expect to see a green online icon beside his name, but that's what I got. 
That only added to how unsettled I was. I checked my phone to make sure it really was 2017. Then I fired off a message to Rap saying, Hey man, long time no speak. I didn't want to just start with business after all that time. I was relieved when he replied back with a friendly hello and asked me how I was doing. So much weird stuff had happened, I was half expecting him to quiz me to see if I was really me. After exchanging pleasantries and catching up a little, I had to ask him why he was still using ICQ after all this time. He said it's because of Y2K. Y2K really happened. It just didn't happen the way everyone expected. It was way more insidious. We all thought computers would just stop working because they couldn't handle the millennium change. But it wasn't that they stopped working. Something happened inside the connection of things. Something bad. The old equipment would be fine. But everything made after December 31st, 1999 would be tainted. That's why he still used ICQ and never let go of his NetZero dial-up connection. I hadn't heard a Y2K conspiracy theory in a very long time, so that was interesting. I chose to ignore it and asked him if he knew about Angelica going missing back in 99. He said he didn't. He figured she just dropped off the internet. Not coincidentally, she went missing right at Y2K, he noted. If that last message really was sent November 1999, then he was right, actually. Given his views, I knew Rap would believe me when I told him what was happening. So I let it all out, and he did believe me. He told me that reminded him of something he heard from another old friend just recently. There was this guy RXT4, or to his closer friends just Reggie, who used to frequent an internet forum on hacking and freaking back in the mid-90s. He had a lot of friends there, was well-spoken and clever enough to earn real respect. Over time, as often happens, he just drifted away from the forum. His posts became less frequent as other aspects of life preoccupied him, and soon enough he was gone. The forum strove for anonymity, for obvious reasons, so no one kept in contact with him. The forum's still there. Nowhere near what it used to be, but the regulars are dedicated. A few months ago, after 20 years' absence, Reggie suddenly shows up on the forum again. His posts are polite, conversational, but just off somehow. Like someone feigning familiarity. He's just trying so hard. He's asking them all how they're doing. Calling them all, at least the old schoolers, by their first names. It's weird, but they're happy he's alive and well, so they reply to him and bring him up to date. Then, without acknowledging anything they say, he starts making post after post about how his life was revolutionized. He found a whole new frontier of hacking. The hacking begins inside you, he said, and he wants to show it to them. The forum folk were flabbergasted by his odd behavior, so they started interrogating him. He goes silent for about a week. Then he sends one last message saying, I love you guys so much, with a tiny Earl link. Rap's friend thinks it's all a joke and that Reggie was just leading the whole forum up to an epic rickroll. He doesn't click it because he doesn't need to hear any Astley and he's busy with something else. He comes back to the forum later, and he decides he's going to go ahead and click the link anyway. It may be something legit. On a whim, he refreshes first to see if anyone replied, saying what the link is. He sees a post in reply from a very trusted and respected member of the forum saying, in all caps, do not click that link whatever you do, and that is not Reggie. That was enough to dissuade everyone from clicking. The fake Reggie deleted his account immediately. The forum moderator and others tried to figure out who the guy was, but no luck. The guy who made the all caps post explained after that he tried to safe browse the link with an old Linux box, and whatever was in there wrecked it. And that box had security out the wazoo. He couldn't explain it. Also, before it wiped out, he thought he saw a picture of himself as a child flash on screen. That, more than anything, convinced him to post the warning in all caps. He said he truly felt it was dangerous. I agreed it was weird for two mysterious internet stories to come his way like that. But I didn't see a connection. Rap went on to explain how this was all a part of what Y2K brought into the digital world. I just told him to let me know if he thinks of anything else that could help. And that I would stay in touch. He casually mentioned as we were saying our goodbyes how he still checks my homepage and that I've been doing great work. 
keep it up. That took me aback because I don't even have a homepage. So I ask him what homepage he means. He said my Fortune City homepage. He's been reading my updates all these years, even after we lost contact, and he's impressed how it's grown. I told him I really didn't understand. I hadn't updated that page since 99, when I created a Mirror of the Heavens Gate website. Tasteless, I know. And besides, does Fortune City even exist anymore? He swore that he's been reading updates all this time. I could tell he was getting angry. He said he's not an idiot, he knows what he's been seeing. But he can't remember what any of the updates were actually about. They were about the future, that much he knew. And he remembered being hooked. Rap went quiet for a few minutes. Then he said, He's looking at the homepage right now, he can send me a screenshot. It was last updated yesterday, and it's all about what they're talking about now, and what's going to happen next. Now this was really creeping me out, because while I was waiting for him I looked it up, and Fortune City ceased to exist in 2012. I told him that was impossible. He pasted the link to a Fortune City page to me and went offline right after. The link just redirected to Dodster.com. I sent him some offline messages with my contact info and to let me know if he's okay. I haven't heard from him since, and I do hope he's alright. I had to walk away from that computer for a while. I felt like I was being watched or something. Every noise was freaking me out. After a sandwich and some tea, I went back mostly just to shut it down. While I was closing everything, I noticed a folder on the desktop that stood out. For one, I never really kept folders on my desktop. And two, I didn't remember this folder at all. It was called Noah's Cape, which sounds like a crappy Bible game. And I never played crappy Bible games. But it wasn't a game inside the folder. It was all pictures and WAV files. My instincts told me to just close the folder, shut down the computer, and forget I had even seen that folder. My curiosity got the better of me. I went ahead and started opening the pictures. All the pictures were of the same thing. They were pictures of me as a teenager. All different days, all in my bedroom. Just me sitting at my computer doing whatever. Mostly from behind me, some from beside me. What was clear was that I couldn't have taken any of those pictures. But I didn't seem to be aware of the photographer. Even though he would have to have been right beside me and I didn't have any recollection of anyone taking these pictures, either. They seemed pointless to have ever taken, let alone kept. It gives me the willies now just thinking about it, because who took those pictures? Why? The wave files were the same. They were recordings of me muttering to myself, typing, moving around on my computer chair, nothing of any interest, and nothing I would have recorded until one of the files when I finally heard a voice that wasn't my own. It was a voice I'd never heard before in my life. I would have remembered that. It was a hollow, metallic man's voice, almost inhuman. It whispered with a hiss, You coming? I shut down the computer and left the house. I was so freaked out that I didn't even want to be in my own home. I just drove around for a while and didn't think. I still can't make any sense of any of what's been happening. Nothing else has happened since, thankfully. Not sure I could take any more, but I also don't think I can drop this. I just need to figure out what to do next. I might try contacting some computer guru friends and see what they can turn up. So like I said in my last update, I contacted my buddy Ben, who's a real computer wizard. He works IT at the University of Guelph. I know that may not sound like the most prestigious place to be, but they actively poached him. He's good. Anyway, I give Ben an idea of what's going on and ask if he can get a lock on that gopher site for me. I also ask if he can safely do it to see if there's anything to this whole site. He says that won't be a problem. The next day, he already comes back to me with the question, Is this some sort of a joke? I don't like wasting my time. I've never seen Ben even slightly irritated before. He tells me when he traced the gopher site, it turns out it's being hosted right there at the University of Guelph. But they don't have a gopher site, never have. Stranger still, it's inside the IT department's offices. I assure him, if it is a joke, I'm not in on it. 
so he manages to track the server to a storage room in a sub-basement below his office. The sub-basement was abandoned years before he even started working there due to ventilation and mold issues. It's just full of old IT crap now and some storage lockers. Someone had set up the server in a storage closet. The closet itself was completely obscured by old computer equipment, and it looked like it had been for several years, meaning the server was running under their noses all that time. When he gets in, he sees an old desktop. It's hooked up to a phone. Beside it, there's a notepad with the words Make It Stop and Abracadabra on it in the same handwriting. He said that was a ominous. The whole place is covered in thick dust, but the server is still running. He hooks up a monitor and keyboard to disable it. And he said the ironic thing is it had an auto shutdown date of that very day, gave him the chills, and he doesn't chill easy. When he let his manager know what he found, his manager told him there's really only one man who could have set that up. Back in the early 90s, a guy worked in the department they all called Milky. Co's last name was Milky and he was really white. He was a little eccentric. But then he had a burnout and it got worse. It started with him pounding his desk. The manager at the time asked him if he was okay. He said there's no way out. Ben's boss said he heard Milky say something like, you think you exist, but you're just another part of it. Everything is just another puzzle. Then he asked, do I exist? He said it was eerie. Every day around 3 p.m., Milky started standing in a dark corner of the office facing the wall. He'd mutter some things. The guys joked that he was at his prayers, but he'd always come away looking more upset than anything else. Once a new guy asked him if he was a Muslim, and he replied with, I'm sorry. And the guy said, for what? He said, it was telling me how your children die. Toward the end, before they fired him, he started telling them about how he found a place on the internet that wasn't made by humans. The guys joked that it was Skynet, since Terminator was a big movie. But he said it wasn't created by machines either. It was just always there, and it showed him things he couldn't unsee. Ben's boss even recalled that he started to tear up. The manager said it was sad to see such a smart guy clearly losing it. He was never caught stealing anything, but equipment disappeared during his shift and it just caught up to him. He told them when they fired him that the secret place got into his head and that he'd sometimes wake up in strange places and he had no idea what he did. Ben said he wouldn't look up the hole for me. The gopher site was freaky enough. Because there was one other thing I should know. The server had a link up through the phone line to a really old webcam. Low res, and the image updates every four seconds or so. It had been running non-stop since 97. All of them just show the front of someone's house, the same house back to 97. He sent me the photos. Because he knew what it was. It was my house. But here's the thing about that. This house that I live in now... I just bought this house two years ago. So why was there a camera focused on it since 97? I can't be the target then. I went back to the police with the webcam information anyway. Turns out, even though they didn't really think there was a crime going on, the local police department got curious. Or at least one officer date, Thero. Because the fact that Angelica disappeared meant there was a potential crime tied up in this. He went all out, investigating this, and actually turned something up. He found Angelica. When he told me she was alive and well, I was thrilled, naturally. He said she voluntarily ran away from home and chose not to have contact with her family. She declined to say why, and legally he was bound to protect her privacy. However, when he told her how it came about that he went looking for her, she asked him if she could speak to me. He gave me her phone number. I called her up. I was nervous since it had been so long and I was excited to hear from her again after thinking the worst. She answered quickly and asked if it was me. I told her yes and said it was nice to hear her voice after all this time. Then she said, without any pleasantries, it wasn't me sending you messages. I told her I figured that much out. That's when she let it drop. I don't think you understand, she said. I have never once in my life sent you any sort of communication before now. I don't know you at all. I felt a little shocked, a little worried, and angry. 
because a part of me thought she was lying. But what if she was telling the truth? I told her she must be confused. I found her through her Wiccan homepage on Angel Fire, and I described the page to her. She said she didn't make that thing, and I should never have gone there. It's bad. She wouldn't say any more on that. Then I told her all the details I knew of her personal life, about her likes and hopes and dreams and her family. She said it was all true, but whoever told him about it, it wasn't her. That's why she wanted to talk to me now, so I would know the truth. She remembered how it used to happen every now and then a long time ago. She would have people tell her they talked to her online all night, but she knew she'd never spoken to them. And they'd tell her she was doing things she knew she'd never done. She was asleep, or sometimes not even in town. Then they'd get weird or disappear. She remembered this one time she was doing her math homework, and a random guy messaged her with the solution to the problem. She was terrified. But she asked him how he knew her math problem, was he spying on her? And he told her, no. She asked him for help. She didn't believe him. So he sent her a screenshot. The message was from a day ago. She'd just gotten the homework that day. She said the worst it got was when she messaged a close friend of hers she saw online on ICQ. Her friend replied with, who is this? She thought it was just a joke, so she said something silly. She didn't remember what. Her friend said she didn't think it was cool to be hacking Angelica's account, or if this was her brother, to knock it off. Angelica swore it was her, and her friend replied, Um, I know you're not Angelica, because Angelica's sitting right here with me. She knew this friend wouldn't joke like that. She didn't have the imagination for it. Whatever it was, her friend really believed she was in the room with her, but she wasn't. Her friend always insisted she was there that night. She said, Angelica was showing her her cool, new homepagey. The friendship fell apart after that, because her friend got strange. That was the first she'd ever seen of the homepage, and she knew it was bad juju. I asked her if she'd ever heard of the whole. She went silent for so long, I thought we lost connection. She said she's still there, she just never expected to hear that again. There was this guy who used to harass her back when she was just about 12 or 13 on IRC. He called himself Holy Moses. He started off nice. He seemed to understand all her problems and to know what she was thinking. At 12, that felt romantic, but she noticed weird things, like he didn't seem to have any life or personality. Any time of the day, he was always online and active. But no one knew anything about him. One day he started telling her stranger things like, Do you remember the three men dressed as bees at the Halloween party? She didn't know what he was talking about. Eight years later at a college Halloween party, she saw three men dressed as bees sitting in the corner of the room. They weren't doing anything. Just sitting still and staring at the floor. Then they turned to her and their eyes looked so black. She ran out of the party. Another time he told her, you can drink and smoke, you know, you died in a car crash. It scared the life out of her. She briefly wondered if she really was a ghost, she said. When she told him to stop tolling her things like that, he said there was a place she could go that was for special people only, and she'd never need to go anywhere else. It was a place on the internet that was infinite in all directions. She said she remembered him saying that specifically and everything she needed would be there. It was called The Hole, and she just had to send him a message with the letter M to get there. She actually tried to do it, because things weren't going well for her, but she sent the letter in by accident because her hands were shaking. Holy Moses went offline and she didn't see him after, until 2010 when she got an email from the New Commandments HolyMoses.com saying, you coming? If anyone was impersonating her, she said that was the most likely person. At the time, she was so naive. Looking back on it now, talking to me, she said he was the creepiest person she'd ever encountered. Just thinking of him creeped her out and made her afraid he'd sense it somehow and come for her. She said that was all she had for me and not to call her again. I thanked her for taking the time to talk to me at all and wished her the best in her life.
I think I'm going to need some time to process all of this. I'm still reeling from my conversation with the real Angelica. I ran it over in my head so many times, like... Maybe the police made a mistake, so of course I've never spoken to this woman. She's the wrong Angelica. But then how did I know everything about her? The scariest part was the sheer commitment and devotion to deceiving me over years of innocent, teenager chatter. It's insane, and I'm not special. I'm just some guy. The biggest lead I had now was this creep called Holymosis. So I decided to log on to IRC and see if I could find him. Angelica told me he was all over EFNet back when he was harassing her. It's a long time since I've used Merck. I barely remembered how it worked. I was introduced to IRC by a group of furries, before I even knew what furries were, with a server called YFNet. That was an adventure. Anyway, it soon started to come back to me. There are so many channels on EFNet, it would take forever. So. I decided to focus on channels that would have been relevant to Angelica back in the day. I just started asking in channels if anyone knew of him or heard of him, but each time I mentioned Holy Moses, the channel fell to almost complete silence. I didn't get a yes or a no, I got ignored. Sometimes users even started to leave the channel. I was about to give up and try another avenue when I got a private message from u 47284 u He or she. I guess, told me I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I asked him why. He said it doesn't come off well to them, whatever that means. And that Holy Moses is just a bot. Been around forever, never logs off, and is almost always idling for days at a time. I told him if that's true, why is everyone so reluctant to talk about it? I didn't want to tell him Angelica's story. I just wanted to find out what he knew. He says the whole thing weirds people out because nobody knows who built Holy Moses. Nobody. Over decades, no one has even claimed ownership. Not even trolls. Nobody knows where it came from. Or why it's there. It doesn't do anything. It's just there, he said. That's the most awful thing about it. Legends have built up around him, like it's a government supercomputer monitoring IRC. Or it's the KGB. Or a ghost. A bot left running long after the owner died and his bank account keeps paying the bills. But no one knows. It's just there. Users have tried messaging it, and it never responds. It never interacts in any channel. It offers no services. It has moments of apparent activity where it is no longer idle. But no one has been able to detect what it does during this time. Except occasionally it'll change channel seemingly at random. He said, there's only one time when it did anything substantial as far as anyone knows. Once in over two decades. And it only made things weirder. I was sending a message to ask him what it was, because he wasn't saying. But just then I heard what sounded like my front door slam. I paused and listened carefully, trying not even to breathe. I didn't hear anything. So I rushed out to the front door. Nobody was there. The doors were all closed and locked. I chalked it up to nerves and went back to my office. When I got back, U47284U had sent me a message saying, Where'd you go? Hope nothing strange happened. I ignored it and asked what it was Holy Moses did. He said, Fine, he'd tell me. In 1999, at 5 a.m. CST on December 31st, Holy Moses joined the channel in Ornithology and made a series of short statements. First, Deceive them at 7 a.m., empty it at 9 a.m., abandon them at 6 p.m., turn back at 9 p.m., and have it your way just before midnight. Then it went offline until January 5th. Why? he asked. Why be silent and useless for years, do that, and then never do anything after? Sometimes, when he really thought about it, it gave him the heebie-jeebies. That was all he knew, he said or anyone knew, and he reiterated that I really shouldn't be looking into this and to just drop it. I thanked him for his help. I remembered a little more of what commands my RC had after getting into the groove some. So I tried a huis on Holy Moses to see if he was out there. He was, or it was, 
It was on one channel only, Still Life. It'd been signed on for 16 days and idle for three. Its IP was just a Y. I was thinking about going to the channel and messaging him to see what would happen. But I got another message from U47284U suddenly. I told you to drop it. Where's your mother? I closed out of Merck immediately and walked away. I figured it was just a nut trying to psyche me out. And it worked. But after it sunk in, I realized I'd better call my mom and make sure everything's okay. To my relief, she answered the phone pretty quickly. I asked if everything was okay. She said sure, except for my little prank. Right away, I felt a chill. I hadn't done anything. I tried to calmly ask her what prank. She said the two guys. They showed up with a note from me to let them in. They don't say anything or do anything. They've just been sitting there with their chairs pulled together in her kitchen, just looking at the floor. You don't recognize them at all? I asked her. She laughed and said no, but I think she was starting to realize I didn't know what was going on. They're dressed in bee costumes, she said, almost as an afterthought. I told her to calmly get out of the house and call the police because I didn't have anything to do with this. She said she was upstairs. She'd have to go past them to get out. I told her to keep me on the phone until she got out. I listened carefully. It seemed to be taking forever. Finally, she said, they're gone. The front door was left open. I told her to call the police right away and check in with me in a bit. While talking, I had absent-mindedly walked from my office to my own kitchen. My front door was also left open. Not only was it locked just a moment ago, but it seemed like quite a coincidence. I closed the door and locked it. Then I looked all around the house with a kitchen knife in hand. I have a one story with a basement, so it was easy enough to cover all hiding places. Nobody there. I figure the door wasn't shut well and the wind just opened and closed it. Still, I was nervous all night. I continued to brush it off. Until two days later, my neighbor came out and asked me if I was having a costume party. I said no. That's when he told me he saw two guys in bee costumes leaving my home two days ago. After leaving my gateway, they just walked straight across the road and behind the neighbor's house, into the woods. How can they even see in the woods at night? He asked. I went to the police with all the new information I had. All these strange events barely seemed coherent at all. They didn't seem incoherent either. They all seemed thinly linked in a secret way. The police were baffled. They had my mom's report too, so they admitted someone was harassing me. But without more evidence, there was really nothing they could do. When we were making the report, my mom told me she was thinking about something just after this happened, because it struck her as odd. Do you remember how you had this dial-up modem, and when you'd run it, you could swear you'd hear a little voice inside talking to you. The way she said it like it was nothing sent a shiver through me because I didn't remember that at all. What? Was all I could say. This is what she said. Yes, you'd said it a go and in all the beeps and pops you said there was a little voice in there with a message. To me it was a lot of crazy noise, but you made me get real close and listen. And you told me it was saying, everything's better in here. Abracadabra. Can't believe I even remembered that. I told her I couldn't remember that. That sounds crazy. But she just gave me a blank stare. I thought maybe she was concerned. So I started to tell her about what was happening. The whole Angelica thing. So she'd understand. I was saying, You remember that girl I used to chat with online in the 90s, Angelica? She kept giving me a blank stare like she couldn't understand me. So I told her more. How I met her on the web ring my Fortune City page was on. And didn't she remember my homepage at least? She shook her head. What she said next scared me. In a way, I've never been scared before. She told me she got an internet connection after I left for college to email me. But before that, we never ever had the internet in our home. I said she must have gotten hit in the head. Because I remember distinctly all these experiences being online. Building my homepage. Yifnet. IRC. ICQ. All of that was when I was in high school. She flat denied it. She said she remembered, though, that I used to tell her I'd found a way to get into the internet without a connection. 
I'd have to call some number with my modem. Then I'd have to sit still at the screen for a few minutes, something like that. She always thought I was joking before day. Thero came to get us. She looked into my eyes and said, you should be careful on that internet, you know, and rose to shake the detective's hand. I was grateful to get off the subject. The detective offered to have a friend in computer forensics take a look at some of the sites I'd reported, but he didn't have much hope. I went to the casino after that to drink and waste money. This just gets more confusing by the moment. I continued to argue with my mother after my last update. I still didn't remember any of the things she told me, but she assured me there was no internet in her house while I lived there. She said I had my floppy disks that I'd take home with me, but that was it. We went on arguing for a while before it occurred to me to ask, take home from where? She said she didn't know. I'd go out at times and I'd come home with discs. I had a Sterilite tub full of them in my closet. None of them were labeled, so she didn't know how I had any idea what was on each one. But I seemed to know. She remembered how I'd dive into my bin and dig around through all the black discs and pop up with just the one I wanted. Generally, she didn't intrude on my privacy, she said. She just saw me do it a few times. I didn't remember any floppy disks. Either my mother was becoming senile or I was losing my mind. Both possibilities were upsetting. My mom's a really good person. Since dad died a few years ago, she's had a rough time, but she's super caring. Doesn't like to see anyone hurt. She could see I was truly upset, not just trying to be right. So she gave me a big hug and she told me I should ask Ricky. I hadn't thought of that. Ricky was an old high school buddy of mine. Well, we were friends from grade two until we left for college. We just drifted apart. I have him friended on Facebook and we never talk. She said when I'd go out to wherever it was I went, I usually had Ricky with me. We'd walk all the way across the bridge into town to pass our weekends. I decided to take her advice. I sent Ricky a message on Facebook he wrote back really fast. I was surprised because I never see status updates or any activity from him. I asked him if he was free for a phone call. I was scared about having another internet-only conversation about this stuff. Facebook said he was typing a reply for about five minutes before my phone rang. I didn't recognize the number, and I know I never gave mine to Ricky. So I hesitated. While I waited, Ricky started typing out. Over and over. So I answered. The voice on the other end sorta of sounded like Ricky. As much as I could remember, but like he was really far away on a beat up CB. I don't know why, but it made me feel weird and uneasy. I said, I think we have a bad connection. He said it's the best possible and that he knows. I was about to ask what he knows when he said alt.rec.birdwatch and hung up. I got a message on Facebook saying, nice catching up. He wouldn't answer anything I said after that. I used to browse news groups as a teen, mostly for the porn at the alt binaries groups. Now I had to look up how to get to news groups. I remembered being able to do it through my email software, but apparently that's not a feature of Outlook. I looked up news group readers and found one I used to use back in the day. Forte agent. I found some servers and started looking for alt-direct.birdwatch. When I finally got on, I found it was mostly British upskirt photography. I didn't understand why Ricky wanted me there until I saw a post with the header, remember the dog, and instantly felt chills. I didn't know why, but there was something to it, something from my past. This is what the post read. Everyone remember how sometimes you'd go in there and it'd be all dusty and no one was there like it was abandoned years ago, but you could still go sit at a computer and get online. And remember how sometimes you'd go in and there'd be these people there and they were really weird and they'd just watch you like you were a rat in a maze and sometimes they were in costumes. Anyone remember the dog? Sometimes there were no people and there was just this dog at the counter. I think it was a golden retriever. It never panted but it watched, and sometimes it'd make you do things. That was it, and that was enough. I was trembling slightly, 
It didn't look like anyone replied, and that was posted three years ago. It seemed out of place, for sure, but I knew what she meant, and I started to remember now. I remember at least that there was an internet cafe in town. It didn't last long. Like most internet cafes, it popped up around 96, 97 to take advantage of the internet craze and let people who didn't own computers experience it. When personal computers became more common, they died a quick death. This cafe was popular with the teens in 96. It got stale after that. That's when something happened to it. It changed management or something. It changed. We tried going back just to hang out. But most kids didn't want to be there. I had some friends who just wouldn't go. Or say why. But Ricky and I would hang out there all the time. Why couldn't I remember that before? My mom was right all along. I replied to the news group message with, Why wasn't I able to remember? It was a long shot since the post was so old. Then I started looking through the other posts to see if there were others like it. There were others. They were all vague. But I knew what they were about. I don't think I've ever been so unsettled. Someone posted, Sometimes when we were hanging out, we thought we were there for just an hour or so. But when we came out, the whole day had passed. And when we talked about what we did there, we had completely different stories, even though we were together the whole time. It was like an acid trip, and we were stupid kids, so we kept going. The Egypt. That's what the place was called. None of these people would say its name, but I remembered it now. That strange little internet cafe just behind the post office where I didn't even realize there was commercial space before. The Egypt. Someone posted. There was this one time when my friend dragged me along and I didn't feel like being there. The owners or staff or whatever weren't there that day. It was the dog. I don't like to think about it. Remember how it never panted? Somehow that sticks out after all this time. We were just goofing off. Nothing special. When I looked over at my friend's screen, he was watching a live webcam of my bedroom, just staring at it. I think this is a dumb joke, but it pissed me off. I told him that was weird, and I was not okay with a webcam in my room. He just said, something's going to happen. Gave me the heebie-jeebies, because he wasn't joking. And it didn't even sound like him. Here's the thing that gets me most. I decided to leave, but need to piss first. On the way out, I go over to my buddy and he's still watching the webcam. That annoys me. But worse, when I looks at the screen, someone's in my bedroom ransacking the place. Under the mattress and drawers, I'm ready to go home and get one of Dad's golf clubs. Then the guy looks right at the camera and starts taking it down. I saw that dude's face. It was me. No doubt about it. That was my face. How is that possible? You're thinking the webcam wasn't live, but it was. Someone replied to that post with, When you were in the bathroom, did you try knocking on the wall? Someone knocks back. Someone replied to that with, I did. He said he'd let me in, but there's no door. In the sea of birdwatching photos and upskirts dating back to 95, that was all I could find. I closed it down. It was too much. I was psyching myself out. But later that day, I had a reply to my post. It read, You weren't meant to. I felt it then, that something really wrong would happen in that place. I reached out to my friend Ben again to see if he could help me identify those people, because I didn't recognize any of the names from around town, but surely that dinky business didn't have locations in multiple towns. Ben got back to me with a last favor message. He said the news group I was talking about doesn't exist, and no such posts were on alt rec bird watching. He did say he went ahead and traced that link I gave him to the hole. He was able to link it to a specific address, which he gave me, and I recognized it. It was the address of the government duplex I grew up in. It seems like every answer is just a lot more questions, but I've made up my mind to go back to my hometown and check it out. If I find anything, I'll let you all know. My hometown isn't too far from where I live now. 
I moved to go to college. It's about a four hour drive away. My mom moved to be close to me after dad died. I don't go back often because there isn't a whole lot to draw me there. I heard from mom when they decided to abandon the housing I grew up in. For whatever reason, they couldn't sell the houses and didn't have the budget to renovate. So the town government is just letting them rot. When I first heard that news, I didn't care much. I try not to get sentimental. But preparing to see the place again, where I had so many memories, got to me. The days of watching the real Ghostbusters in my fuzzy Star Wars pajamas. The days of watching the X-Files with Mom. The days of lying in bed all summer reading UFO books. Of course I realized it'd just be empty space now, nothing in common with those memories other than a floor plan. That all went away once I got inside. I snuck in through the window I used to climb through when I forgot my key. As soon as my feet hit the floor, the music started. It was low and distorted, so I couldn't make out what it was. But I was sure it wasn't playing until I entered. Someone else had to be inside and knew I was inside, and that scared the heck out of me. I waited for a sound other than the music, but it was just the music. I felt a little more courage, so I started walking toward the stairs. The music got louder, but no less distorted. The tune was familiar, though. I went up the stairs slowly. That's where my old room was. By the time I got to the top, I knew what I was listening to. Early in the morning, by Vanity Fair, an oldie, and it was coming from a grimy old radio propped in front of my bedroom door. That was odd, because the song was playing on a loop. I switched the radio off. Then I realized I'd telegraphed my exact location by doing that. I broke out into a cold sweat for a moment waiting for something to happen. But all I heard now was a buzzing from in the room, like a beehive. I also saw my name plastered was still on the door. Other people had lived here after mom left, I'm sure of that. Why would they have left that? I opened the door. I didn't and still don't know how to react to what I saw inside. The room had been set up to look exactly like it did when I was a teen. Not like it did after I left for college or even just before, like it did in 1999, down to the details. The Halloween lights around the desktop, Fangoria posters on the walls, my old Mr. T pillow on the bed. Someone had to have known my room in intimate detail to have done this. Who could have? And why? It made no sense. Then there were some details that were off, but in such a way that it seemed intentional. Like in my Candyman poster, it said it starred Tiny Lister instead of Tony Todd. And the wall was painted with the same stucco, but the color was a shade or two off. Things like that. They were everywhere. That was more troubling to me than the recreation itself. I found where the buzzing was coming from. The computer. It was running. Maybe Ben was right about the hole. I sat down and activated the screen. Like the rest of the room, the desktop was a faithful snapshot of 1999. Every icon just as I remembered, I couldn't find anything running out of the ordinary. It just felt strange, like I was transported to the past. That's when I noticed the one thing out of order with my desktop, an icon way in the corner, almost off the screen called Milk and Honey. I never had any such file, I'm sure of that. I started moving the mouse up to it. I felt strangely afraid to open it. Before I could, the radio started blasting early in the morning again. My heart almost stopped. I looked behind me expecting the worst. Nobody was there. I got up to switch the radio off, but it was still off. I checked the batteries and there were none. That's when I realized the music wasn't coming from the radio. I wanted to get out of there. I felt fear before. I don't think I've ever known what dread feels like before then. Not really. But I had to find out what milk and honey is. It loaded a Telnet connection. I hadn't seen one of those in a while. The connection worked because in a few seconds an ash eye mountain filled the window. I waited and waited for something to happen. But nothing did, just the mountain. I tried submitting some inputs. I even wondered if the connection died. I was going to retry, but I got a phone call from Date. They're out just then. The first thing he asked me when I answered was, Are you alone? I thought that was strange, but I told him I believed I was, but I wasn't sure. He asked where I was. 
I told him. He said I needed to get out of that house slowly and calmly, get in my car and drive back to him. I'd never heard him sound like that before. Something was definitely wrong. I was ready to listen, but I wanted to know what's going on. He said he had a gut feeling about something and decided to check back with Angelica to make sure everything was okay. Everything was not. He said that girl he'd put me in contact with two weeks ago was not Angelica. They had no idea who that woman was because no one's been able to find her. The home she was in was apparently a rent house between renters. Nobody lived there at the time. All they found left behind was a script detailing what she was supposed to say when she spoke to me. I was speechless and confused. I'd just readjusted my thinking to believe everything with Angelica was a lie. And now that the truth about the lie was also a lie, did that make the lie true? But it got worse. Debt. Therout said he contacted Angelica's family again and asked more questions. A lot more. She had every message I ever sent her printed out. Pictures of me. A map of my hometown. A doll. He said in some of the pictures I was clearly sleeping. Did I know of any such pictures? I couldn't speak. He took my silence for a no, and he was right. There's more, he said, but you have to get back here now, calmly. I thanked him and prepared to do just what he said. That's when I noticed more had happened on the Telnet screen. There was a question up. Are you alone? That was what the detective had just asked. That was frightening enough, I typed. I don't know. Then text started appearing very slowly letter by letter. I took a picture so I can type it out as it was. This mess egg is a warning turn Smith to be dilettantes after after 2k Brea. This Devi is shoot it all down get it save yourself. It repeated three times then the connection ended. I tried it again and it just wouldn't connect anymore. I wasn't sure what to do. It didn't feel right breaking the computer so I just unplugged the power from the back. I got up ready to calmly exit like the detective said. I would have been okay, I think. But I saw something that'll never leave me for as long as I live. There were strands of dark hair flowing from under the bed. I froze where I was and kept staring at them to make sure I was seeing right that it wasn't just threads because it was dark in that area. As my eyes adjusted, I realized I wasn't just looking at hair. I had been looking right into someone's eye for half a minute and whoever it was had just been staring right back the whole time. I screamed, and I ran, jumping several steps at a time out the front door. I resolved to never, ever go back there again. I don't know who that was. I didn't want to find out, knowing I was being watched that whole time. It still felt like that eye was on me. That's pretty much ruined my memories of that place forever. One more thing before I end this update. I went to where the Egypt used to be before I left town. It had been converted to a pub. People were there, so I felt comfortable going in. I got a much needed drink and asked how long they'd been here. So happened I was speaking to the owner. He said the place was a foreclosure he snatched up in auction. The previous owners just abandoned everything. The computers were still running when he moved in. He figured they'd been stealing electricity from the post office. I told him I used to come here for the internet. Then he said my name and asked, is that you? I wasn't sure I wanted to answer, but I did. I told him it was. He said there was a little box left behind with a note asking that it be given to me. It was junk, he said, just old floppy disks, but he liked the mystery of it, like a message in a bottle kind of deal, so he held on to it. I had to buy a disk drive before I could even read what was on them. I'm not sure what to make of it. Each disk had a picture of a different teen. Some information about each one. A bunch of bookmarked websites and copies of different internet activities. They all had two things in common. They were all missing children. And they all had internet contact with Angelica. Except for one of them. That one was Angelica herself. I handed it over to the police. This is way over my head. A lot has happened since the last update. 
It began when I turned over the floppy disks to date Thero. This became a big deal to the RCMP because it connected a bunch of missing persons cases that were cold and that no one thought had anything to do with the other. The problem is the cases are all from back in 99, not long after I turned in the discs dead. Thero came to ask if I was completely certain that the pub I was in was behind the post office. I confirmed. He said I had to be mistaken because that place was empty when he went. Then it must be closed for the day, I figured. When I was there, they had quite a few patrons, a slot machine in the corner, a TV blaring a sports game. It was a busy enough place. He said I wasn't understanding him. It's empty. There is no pub there. There's no business at all. That building had been abandoned for years. It was covered in dust and there was nothing but a few old computers against the walls to show anyone had ever been there. I felt something like vertigo. I knew I was just there. I talked to the bartender. I had a drink. How could that have just vanished? I told the detective he could dust the box of discs for prints. The bartender handled it with bare hands and that was the only building behind the post office. I didn't know what to say that'd make him believe me. Then he said with a chuckle, Oh, there was one patron, a stray dog. I don't even know how he got it. It was all sealed up. I didn't think anything of this until he said, He's been with me ever since, so well behaved. I asked if it's with him now. He said yes. I felt shivers down my spine. I asked him. It's a golden retriever, isn't it? He asked me how I knew that. I didn't try to explain. I found the first excuse to hang up. He did tell me he'd been to my old home. There had clearly been someone squatting there, he admitted. They seized the computer to be certain, but there was nothing mysterious. And the thing under the bed was a doll. He even sent me a picture. I told him that thing in the picture isn't what I saw. The eye I saw was wet, and it saw me. I can't blame the detective for starting to doubt me. Nothing about this has made sense. And everything I thought I understood turned out to be something else altogether. Even I'm starting to doubt me. I wanted to keep busy myself, so I started doing some research into local records to see if I could find who owned the place. I expected to find some change in management in the 90s, or where the place got sold in the 2000s, but there were no records of the sort because it never did get sold or change management. It was purchased in 1980 and had had the same owner ever since. A company or organization called The New Way. It didn't seem like it could be the same owners because that place was never used before the Egypt. In 1980, there wasn't really an internet. Who would buy a place and do nothing with it for 15 years, just waiting for the internet to happen? I just couldn't find anything else. Nothing on the company at all. It's hard to describe how alone I've felt these last few weeks. I've talked to a lot of people about it, but their help has been limited. That's why I decided to try to go back to alt.rec.birdwatch if it was still there. At least there someone might be having a similar experience, and I had no trouble finding it again, actually. I don't know why Ben couldn't. So I made my post. I asked if anyone else had heard of the new way. Then I waited. To my surprise, I got a call from Ben right after. He asked me if I'd done anything recently. I asked him to be more specific. He said, You must have done something because something happened. I still had no idea what he meant. He sounded strange. His words were just slightly slurred and there was no accent anywhere in his sentences. Just a string of words. Something's happening right now, he said. I booted it up again. Ben was just the most rational, bland guy. Something was definitely wrong for him to be acting like this. So I asked him if he was okay. He said that I needed to check my messages. I asked what messages. Listen, he said. You have to check your messages. They've been waiting for you. The whole thing didn't feel right at all. I asked him again what messages he meant. All I heard was little whispering sounds like psst, psst, psst. I thought I was losing him. But when I listened carefully and turned up the volume, I heard it. He was saying, please, over and over and over. I felt a pit in my stomach. I asked if he needed help, if there was anything I could do. 
He went silent for several seconds. I said, Ben. Still silence. Then he shouted, please. So loud I dropped my phone. I scrambled to put the battery back in with shaking hands. And then I called in a wellness check on him. I called the Guelph campus too, just in case. I didn't know what else to do. I'd never experienced anything like that. I checked my email right after to see if I had anything from him, but I didn't. I had no voicemails, the only other messages I could think of what ICQ. So I powered up the old computer again to check on my ICQ account. It's possible there was nothing. I just had to make sure. It felt like it was taking forever to start up. When it did, I did have a message waiting. It wasn't from anyone I recognized, but I don't think it was from Ben. The name on the account was Constance Ike. The message said, Heaven. There was a link to an MP4 video. I clicked it. The download box said it would take 30 hours to complete. So I just let it go. I tried replying to Constance too, but ICQ alerted me that the account was disabled. I also couldn't find any results on any search for such a person. I don't think Ben would ever make a fake account like that. But how did Ben know about the message? I got contacted by Guelph University's campus security later that day. They asked me when I'd last spoken to Ben. I told them. They said he hadn't been to work in a few days and has not been answering the phone. I was the last one to hear from him, and they recommended I file a missing persons report. I did. So far, nothing's come of it. I'm worried about him. The next day, I got an email replying to my post. I recognized the address. It was the same person who posted about the dog. She said I needed to call her urgently and provided a 1-800 number and a series of numbers and letters for a turn to 2 BMT. I got an interactive menu system for a tanning supplies company. I pressed each of the numbers in the order, she said. And the system said I was being transferred to an account specialist. I heard someone pick up the line. Almost right away, she said, You went back to the cafe, didn't you? You shouldn't have done that. Was it the pub? I think I gasped. She said she couldn't talk long, so I had to just listen. She wanted to tell me something that might help me. She said she started remembering about a year ago. She remembered the sessions in the Egypt. They preyed on vulnerable misfit kids. Whoever came there got introduced gradually to this website called The Hole. Once they showed it to us, we had to sit there and study it. Solve its puzzles, but it'd change us. That's what they always said. She didn't know if they built it or not, but it's what they were all about. This is the thing to remember, she said. I think we're still in the hole. I tried to ask her what that even meant. What she was talking about. She had already hung up before I got the chance. I haven't heard from her since, or from date, they're out. Still no news on Ben. I don't know if I'm any further ahead. Every step forward is three steps into the mist. That's how it feels anyway. But I do have one other thing. The video file finally finished downloading. I knew what I was looking at as soon as the video started playing. It was VHS security cam footage of Inside the Egypt. It's been a long time, but it hit me fast. There was no timestamp. The footage was grainy and the tracking was off, but I knew it. There we all were, sitting at our computers, with our backs turned to them, staring at a wall. I was able to pick myself out in the group. We just sat there, staring ahead. Nobody was moving or saying anything. I couldn't make out what the computers were doing behind us, but we weren't touching them. What were we staring at? What were we doing? Why would I do this? I couldn't remember any of it. I was the only one that ever looked away from the wall. I kept glancing over behind the bar. It was hard to tell, but I think I was afraid of something. I looked frightened. I stared at the area on the screen I kept glancing to. The tracking lines were in the way, but they faded a little and I was able to make it out. It was the dog. And when I saw it on the screen, it turned to look right at the camera and didn't look away. It's like it knew I was watching. I know that's crazy, but it creeped the heck out of me. I shut the video down there, and I don't plan to open it again.
I'm still pretty shook up, and I'm done with this, but I'll try my best to explain this clearly. So I kept researching the new way, because there had to be something to it. I was able to find a record that mentioned the owner's name, Joseph Van Eck. That wasn't familiar to me. I looked for obituaries, white pages, anything that could lead me to him. I didn't think to look for missing persons cases, but I stumbled on it. An old homepage asking to help us find Uncle Joe. I emailed his niece from the address listed asking for more information. The page was made in 99, so I didn't expect the email to work. But it did. I got a reply the same day asking me how I knew Uncle Joe. I wasn't sure how to answer, but I decided to go with honesty. And I'm glad I did, because this is what I got back that night. I'm going to put this all in one email because I don't want us to have to talk again. Uncle Joe was a good man. He used to be a rabbi. He raised me after my parents died in an accident. He was good with electronics. He thought computers were the future. That's why he called his company The New Way. He bought up all the space he could afford with his inheritance. It was more than he could handle, so he just rented the space out. Life was good. He kept selling computers in his little shop. I helped when I got home from school and on weekends. He kept bees and I helped with that too. Life was good until he married Connie in 1994. She was a strange woman. She didn't like me. She was into things that scared me. I saw her make a homeless man cry by staring at him. Animals would go quiet when she was around. Sometimes she'd hide under my bed for hours, waiting for me to go to bed at night. When I did, she'd slide out and grab me. I'd scream and scream. She'd walk away like nothing happened. She didn't laugh or say anything. I didn't understand. I still don't. I started sleeping on a beanbag chair in the basement after that. She'd often go into a corner of the room and whisper to someone. There was nobody there, no phone or nothing. She'd even get mad at whoever it was. Then she'd go back to knitting. She was always knitting something, but the things she'd knit were useless. Gloves with three fingers, socks, but she'd seal up the ends so you couldn't wear them. I didn't hate her. I was scared to death of her. I don't know why she made Uncle Joe so happy. I remember the day she started pressuring Uncle Joe to turn his rental spaces into internet cafes. She told him the internet was the real future and would outlast computers. She'd say, we are the internet. She made him get it at home, even though it was really expensive then. She had him go to this website she called The Hole. I remember that, because it always made me nervous when she talked about it. Uncle Joe asked her who made it. She said she had no idea. Nobody did. She found it already made just like everyone else. She told him it called to her. At the time, I thought that sounded flaky. Now it just gives me creeps. Uncle Joe changed after that. They spent a lot of time on that website. I don't understand it. There was nothing there. I looked over their shoulders and it was all blank. But they saw all sorts of things. And when the internet cafes started opening, more people were involved. It was strange. They would sit and stare into space, and strange things would happen, like I could swear I heard a voice in my modem when I'd dial up, and when I listened it was saying, it hurts. I said it was all in my head, and another time I got an email asking, why wasn't I able to remember? I don't know why that message upset me so much. I remember it so vividly. One night when I was alone with Uncle Joe for once, I told him I wished things would be like they used to be. He said, that's what everyone wants, but it can't be. He leaned in close and whispered, the whole talks, tells us things. He told me about how, this is strange and I didn't understand it, but I'll try. How human beings are set to be obsolete and they need to upgrade for the new era. He said, Y2K, if you remember that, wasn't going to affect computers, it was going to affect people. The whole showed him how people can put their souls on the internet and be upgraded. Everyone else would just decay over generations into beasts that kill and eat and watch TV. I didn't dare tell my Uncle Joe that this was crazy. I couldn't hurt his feelings like that. But I knew something bad was going to happen. Uncle Joe and Connie went off to open their internet cafes all over. 
and I left the home for college. Uncle Joe kept in contact until 1999. Then I lost him. Connie disappeared too. I know some bad things happened around those internet cafes, but it's not Uncle Joe's fault. Please don't blame him. I had plenty more questions and I sent them to her. I never heard back. But at least she gave me some real answers and it all led right back to the hole. So that really left me with one thing to do. I figured I had to go to the hole after all. If I ever wanted to know what was going on, anyway. I pulled up the instructions Angelica sent me on how to get back to the hole. I can't say I felt like I was doing the right thing. I didn't. It felt tea kettle wrong. Like there was something really terrible just off screen in my memories. I knew it was there, but I couldn't see it. So I welcomed the interruption when my phone rang. My neighbor was calling to tell me the man in the bee costume was back. He was standing in my front yard, he said. I walked over to the window and peeped out. It was nice and toasty inside, but I felt my whole body breaking into goosebumps. He was there, under the streetlight, looking right at the window. I asked my neighbor how long he'd been there. He said he called me as soon as he saw it and that I should hang up and call the police. I tried, but there was no point calling the police. As soon as I hung up, he walked across the road and into the woods. I noticed when hanging up that I had an email notification from Ben. I was glad that he was okay. He'd sent me a video. I played it right away. On it, he said he went into hiding because things were getting weird. There were little things at first. Then one night a group of people he'd never seen before knocked on his door at 3 a.m. He didn't answer. He watched through the peephole. They didn't move, didn't knock again, didn't try to look in the peephole. They just stood there staring at the door. They didn't look homeless or crazy, just people. He called through the door that they had the wrong address. They started laughing, loud, fake guffaws. Then they silently walked away. He said he'd been getting calls where he just heard a dog growling on the other end. And then a few growly words like, why, and abracadabra. Then he started having fits. He upset a lady at the grocery store during one, whatever I got into, he said, it's bad juju. Like KGB or Illuminati bad. He pointed the camera away from himself to a computer monitor. It was an old webcam. Every five seconds it updated with a new image. But this one wasn't pointing at my house like before. It was pointing at a doorway in some dark room. Watch, he said. I did. There was a shadow moving around. It could be nothing, but I waited and watched. I figured if it was nothing, Ben wouldn't have kept recording. Finally, I saw something entering the frame. It was a man. The image was so grainy it was hard to say who at first. But when he turned, I saw it was Det, Theralt. It had to be the Egypt. He was walking into the bathroom of the Egypt. Frame by frame, I watched him slowly peer in, shine his flashlight, and then disappear inside. After a few frames of no activity, a blurred figure appeared for one frame and was gone. It looked like someone in robes running into the bathroom with a knife. I called the police department and let them know what I thought I saw. Then I hopped in my car and started driving out there myself. I don't know what I hope to do. I'm not a fighter. I'm a data analyst. But I couldn't just watch something happen. The whole way I told myself I was doing something stupid. When I got there, the parking lot of the post office was completely empty. Even the detective's car was nowhere. I parked in front of the pub Egypt and went in. It was set up just like in the past. Computers everywhere. A sign-up sheet on the counter. And no one there. I called out for the detective, but I got no answer at first. Then I heard a response. It took me a moment to recognize my own voice. It was the conversation I had with Angelica. Coming from one of the computers, on the screen was my old homepage. After all that time, I knew it right away. The animated skeleton gifs and links to conspiracy theories and Heaven's Gate. That page was deleted almost two decades ago. On another computer, I saw a video of a middle-aged couple staring into the camera, like they were watching me, and a little girl peeking over their shoulder. 
The woman said, it chose you. And the man was shaking his head slightly. He looked frightened. Then another computer started playing a song. I didn't know it, but I recognized the sound of Vanity Fair again. That made it click. I'd just walked into a trap. I had to get out, but I couldn't. These people started coming inside, a middle-aged woman with long black hair, well-dressed, an older businessman, it looked like, a rough-looking homeless guy. More and more people crowded in without saying anything. One of them was Angelica. I just knew it. They were moving toward me. I tried talking to them, but their faces were blank, emotionless. They didn't seem to hear. I ran into the bathroom and closed the door behind me. It had a simple turn-the-bolt lock, so I locked it. I pulled out my phone to see if I could get the police, but there was no signal. That's when I remembered the story about the guy knocking on the wall. Maybe there weren't bricks on the other side. I knocked for a hollow spot and started kicking a hole in the drywall. I tore the rest of the hole open with my hands. There was space back there, but it wasn't a way out. Or not, obviously. I used my phone's flashlight to look inside. The space was about two feet in width to the brick wall. I stepped in. A computer was running in the far corner of the space. Just the tower, no monitor or any way to interact with it. I heard those people breathing outside the door. They weren't trying to open it or beat it down. They were breathing heavily against it. Then I saw something moving under the door frame. I thought it was a finger slipping under maybe trying to grab a shoelace or something. But it was too pink. It was a tongue. One of them was licking under the door. That scared me enough to go deeper into the space, stumbling over pieces of sheetrock. I tried to follow the lines on the computer to see if they went outside, but they didn't. So I grabbed the tower and used it to beat against the brick wall, hoping to knock the bricks loose. They didn't budge, but the computer was in pieces. I gave up. As I climbed back to bathroom, I noticed two things. One, written above the hole I just made. The hole had been painted. The other, it's not sheetrock I was stumbling over. It was bones. I hurried out and sat in the bathroom stall for what felt like hours. I didn't come out until date. Thero showed up. He said no one was out there when he arrived. All the computers were gone when he took me out. He said he hadn't been there all day. Also, he had no idea what dog I was talking about, but the bones were there and very real. He said we'd have a lot to discuss in the next few weeks, and that I needed to quit meddling. I agreed. I'm done. The bee guys, Moses, Angelica, go for sights. They can do what they want. I'm done. Oh, if anyone's interested, I did look up the song I heard. It was Come Tomorrow. I think it really is over now. There were obviously a lot of loose ends after my last update. Too many. I think I can put most of them together now. At least I'll try as best I can. I can't say I'm right about everything, but I think I'm close. First, here's what happened. After the incident at the Egypt, I went home to relax and forget with some DVR'd Seinfeld episodes. It was the episode where George finds a doll that looks like his mother. I was letting my mind blank watching screen, but I noticed the sound was off at times. I tried turning the TV and DVR on and off. That seemed to fix it. Then it happened again, like the voices would get doubled randomly, some kind of echo. The next time it happened, I tried muting and unmuting the TV to see if that would help. That's when I noticed that the echo seemed to be coming from behind me. That was weird because I don't have surround sound or any other TVs in the home. I left the TV on mute to listen carefully, make sure I wasn't just hearing some other background noise. I would understand if my mind was playing tricks on me after all that happened. Before I could unmute the TV again, I heard Kramer saying, Jerry, you don't really exist. You're just a part of me. I need you back inside. I dropped the remote without even realizing it. It hit the floor and the batteries when rolling, scaring me even more than I already was. I grabbed my phone to call 911. It was dead. The battery had been removed. I felt really, truly in danger for the first time since this all began. The weird people was one thing, 
This felt like premeditated murder. While I stood still, thinking, waiting for something to make me react, I heard my mother's voice. I made you some blueberry pancakes and you're just gonna love the way they feel inside your body. These are words I'm sure I'll never forget for the rest of my life. Whatever was making those sounds wasn't my mother. I haven't made clear the layout of my house. It's a three bedroom and I made the last bedroom my living room. I used the actual living room for a book movie library. I wanted to be original. That was a very dumb idea. To get out of the house, I'd have to run right to where the voices were coming from. My windows don't open, but I thought about breaking one. Then I heard the front door open. I was sure I'd locked it, but I was sure of a lot of things that were wrong lately. And someone shouted, get over here, quick. I sighed in relief. Because I recognized Dade, Thoreau's voice. That guy is a credit to his profession, I thought. I started out to the front door, trusting he'd protect me. Something stopped me in my tracks. My phone was ringing, the phone with no battery, no power source of any kind. The caller ID was don't go. I answered and only heard the sound of buzzing bees. I don't pretend to understand this at all, what the bees have to do with anything. But I took the warning seriously. I went back to my living room, closed the door, locked it, and smashed a window. I climbed out. I heard my dad's voice yelling at me to get back immediately. In any other context, that would have made me cry like Niagara Falls. I miss dad a lot, but I knew that wasn't my dad, and it felt all the more evil because of it. I have every drop of you, dad's voice shrieked. I ran to my neighbor's home. He kindly let me in and allowed me to use his phone. His dogs were going wild, but nothing happened until the police arrived. They got here pretty fast and date. They're all with them. They were in my home for five minutes before they came out with someone in cuffs, kicking and struggling. It was definitely a woman. That's what happened. And that was the last. Since that incident, nothing strange has happened. Life has been relatively peaceful, and I've been able to start work on picking up the pieces. I've been able to think a little. It hasn't been long, but from what I heard from police Dati Theralt and independent investigators that got involved, this is what I've been able to piece together. Make of it what you will. So, first of all, there really was a girl named Angelica. I really talked to her in the 90s. She had a good home, a good middle-class family, a good school, but she didn't like any of it. She liked computers, and that was it. When the internet came around, she could pretend to be anyone or anything. She liked that even more. Then she met me. Something about the way I talked to her just rubbed her the right way because she got obsessed with me. Her bedroom was covered with sketches of me and her together. Investigators didn't know who it was at the time and she'd taken her hard drive with her, so it was just some boy. Could have been David Borianaz for all they knew. When she ran away from home in 1999, it had nothing to do with the hole or the Egypt or Y2K. She ran away to be with me and she succeeded. I had no idea the whole time, but she was with me. Without her computer, she didn't know how to reach out. So she just lived in nooks and crannies of my home until I left for college in 2001. She slept under my bed, just like in the recreation of my bedroom in my old home. I don't know if she followed me to college or not. She wouldn't talk about that time, they say, but I suspect she just stayed there in my old bedroom waiting for me to come back. After 18 years, she's tired of waiting. Something sets her off, I guess. Because she starts sending me emails, she seizes on the whole, I assume, because it really was a secret website that I shared with her. More on that later. Then she starts constructing a mystery to lure me in. I'm not really sure why. I think maybe she was psychologically bound to that room. Or she thought it was the only way to distract me from my regular life. The purpose was to bring me back to her. Sort of. Over the years, she has watched me and listened to me for countless hours. She has trained herself to imitate the voices of almost anyone in my life. That even extended to the cast of Seinfeld, apparently. She used her technical knowledge to imitate acquaintances online, like Ben was just on vacation. All trickery. She carefully and cleverly manipulated me every step of the way. I was a total puppet. I don't know if I threw her for a loop even once. But where it was all supposed to end was me coming back to my room in the old house. Finding my room the way it used to be, with the old dial-up modem, 
the old tower, my old VCR, and a PlayStation 1 hooked up, ready to play. It was like being a teen again. I think she expected me to just revert back to my old self. Maybe she thought she'd finally come out of hiding and we'd get to do it different this time. Maybe it was just nostalgia and hyperdrive. Either something I did ruined it, or she couldn't bring herself to come out of hiding because it didn't end there. So she kept the mystery going, dragged me back to the Egypt by imitating Ben and the detective, hired those people to spook me. What did she expect to happen from there? I don't know. I can guarantee she was reading every one of these updates. Maybe seeing her name involved in my life story every week was enough for her. It's sad, but it's also terrifying. That kind of obsession never stays satisfied for long. That was Thoreau's words. I'm not that philosophical. He told me if I had gone toward his voice that night instead of going out the window, I'd be dead. He wouldn't tell me what she had planned for me. He said I'd sleep better never knowing. The uncomfortable shake in his eyes told me all I needed to know. If it could upset him, it had to be pretty bad. That leaves an awful lot of mysteries, right? What about the Egypt, Joseph Van Eck? Where'd the pop-up pub come from? Well, the pub is easy. It was a group of community college kids and their calculus professor partying in an abandoned space. They didn't want to get busted, so they pretended to be a pub and put everything back the way it was meticulously. The Egypt is also kind of easy. So Joseph Van Eck and his niece were actually not inventions of Angelica. How much of the more mysterious aspects of the story are true I'm inclined to be skeptical. Police were able to confirm that the Egypt was indeed the front of a doomsday cult, and they really had abducted children to digitize their souls. The niece knew about this and said nothing. I was introduced to the whole through the Egypt. The website, probably created as a joke, was mysterious enough to captivate them. They believed it was something otherworldly. Angelica knew about it through me. She was never involved in their sessions. I was. They drugged us and would have us stare into the hole. Then we had to look away and feel our souls being digitized. The teens who showed the most promise or facility for brainwashing were taken. That's an active investigation now. The bones in the walls were adult bones. The teens have never been seen since. Neither have the Van X. So nobody knows what they did with them. I'm just glad I wasn't good enough to be one of their chosen few, and that's it, that's what I know. It doesn't answer everything. Like, whose bones are in the wall? How did Angelica know so much about the Egypt without having any connection to them? Some things time will tell, some things we may never know. I accept that. There's just one thing that does bug me, because the more I think about it, the less sure I feel about everything like the last piece of the puzzle, but it doesn't fit in the last space. It's one of the things Angelica had in her possession. It was an old Bass VHS tape. I didn't want to watch it alone, so I watched it with Mom. That turned out to be a good idea. It was actually one of my family's few home videos, Halloween 1989. Dad holding the camera is coming up to our bathroom where Mom is putting the finishing touches on my costume. She backs away, and I jump out at Dad buzzing. A bee, he says. Holy Moses, that's all the end. Holy Moses! My last update. For historical purposes, I'd like to thank you all for bearing with me. I realize I owe you an explanation. And you'll get it as much as one is possible. I'm writing this from a public library. I didn't want to take any electronics with me. It just makes me too vulnerable. After I left the Egypt for the last time, I came home and settled down to watch a DVR'd episode of Seinfeld with some chai tea, anything to rest my nerves. Just as I settled, I got an email notification on my phone that said, please look and provided a link. I didn't recognize the number, but since the link was to a Guelph University page, I figured it was Ben. The link brought me to the webcam that Ben found weeks ago on the Gopher server. I was regretting my decision to trust it already. I felt fear, frustration, and anger welling up because I just wanted to be left alone and I couldn't get any peace. Soon, it was only fear I felt because I noticed something happening. The trunk of my car was opening. 
When the frame updated four seconds later, the trunk was fully open and someone was slithering out. I guess I was mesmerized because I just kept watching, waiting for the next frame update. By the next frame, he was standing at my door. I went to my front door and looked out the peephole. No one was there. I looked at my phone again to check the webcam. Someone was, or should be, standing right in front of it. Maybe it's something that happened in the past. I looked through the peephole again, and it was blocked. It took a moment to realize I was looking right into someone's face. An awful, hate-filled face. I took my phone with me to my office and locked the door. I heard my front door knob rattling and then open. I knew I'd locked it. I don't know how he managed that. Whoever it was walked in purposefully right to the office like they already knew where I was going. I didn't have much confidence in the lock. I expected the door to fly open immediately. Instead, I heard a weird, distant voice. It sounded like the weather radio, saying, Why did you leave? I called 911. I heard the operator pick up, but I couldn't speak. The door opened, and this person walked in. His face was hazy, but it was familiar. He had some kind of weapon. He forced me to get on my computer and go to the hole. He walked me through each step. I didn't have a choice. I did it. After all those years, there it was. The same bland page that seemed to do nothing, but I could feel it like fingers poking in my brain. It was like I was still in my office, but that guy was gone. So were other things. I could see things that were always there, but weren't really there. I guess you'd say they're in other dimensions, but that's not right either. And it wasn't like here, where things are ordered and make sense. Everything was ordered wrong. I was still on the phone with 911, I realized. I tried to tell the operator that the man was gone. Nothing I said was coming out right, and the operator was telling me, you're in big trouble when the captain arrives. You ever heard of freaking? Ben asked me. It was disorienting, but I knew right away I was looking at Ben. And I wasn't in my home. There was a guy standing with Ben that I didn't recognize. I asked if I was in Guelph and how I got there. He assured me I was in a motel in my hometown. He didn't trust technologically facilitated communication anymore, so he came all the way to talk to me. And he introduced his associate as Milky. He'd found him holed up in a Catholic commune in rural Ontario. They said I was in serious danger. Milky spoke then. His voice was slurred. He was aware of it because he apologized for it. He went on to tell me what happened to him. He said he'd been a part of this hacking community for years. Nothing for profit. Just good old-fashioned mischief. They especially liked dicking with fringe and religious groups they started on IRC. When the WWW became the thing, they migrated to a web forum. One day a hidden link appears on the forum. Other members try to scrub it and insist that no one touch it. One of the guys on the forum, one of their oldest members who fled the Soviet Union back in the 70s, says he knows what it is. It was studied before, and it was never, ever supposed to be available to the public. He'd seen what Stalin could do, what murderers could do, and he wasn't scared. This thing scared him. It sounded like a put-on. Milky said this guy had a healthy sense of humor, but the guy swore it was real. He said it started way back when the first computers were being networked, the electrons and other particles that are brought together and herded about, in making these connections, leave empty spaces of nothing where they were. It's like an anti-net. And the more and more we connect all over the world, the more this anti-net grows. And what's so scary about that, someone on the forum asked. And he replied, just because it's empty space doesn't mean there's nothing in it. He wouldn't elaborate on that, no matter how much they tried. Milky figured the guy didn't want to make them curious about it. That failed. He was very curious about it, more than ever, so he clicked the link. He remembered being disappointed by it, because it was just a blank page. But after clicking it, he started to notice strange things happening. He lost track of time. He'd be told by people he knew that he'd done things he had no memory of doing, or even that he couldn't have done because he was doing something else. This one time, he heard his dog barking. It was 3 a.m. He got up to see what was going on. The dog was standing in the entrance to his living room just barking non-stop. 
He expects to find a mouse cornered in there, but he said he remembers being so startled. He tried to scream, but no sound would come out. Two men in business suits were sitting on his couch. He immediately thought of a mob hit, but it's Canada. What mob? He turned on the light. They didn't flinch. They looked like normal businessmen. They were staring at the floor. He told them to get out of his house or he'd call the police. They just got up and left. On the way out, one of them said, you asked us to come and sit here. He never saw those men again in his life. Another time, he called his brother in Vancouver to wish him a happy birthday. They had a pleasant chat and he hung up the phone, went about his business. About an hour later, it hits him like a punch in the gut. His brother died two years ago. He always called him on his birthday. He just did it so reflexively, and when he got an answer, it was like old times. So, who was that he was talking to? His story sounded a lot like the ones the fake real Angelica told me about when I talked to her weeks ago. So either I was speaking to the real Angelica then, or maybe this wasn't the real Ben and Melke. I guess I couldn't be sure about anything anymore. At least, it was less scary to believe they were real. During this time, he kept checking the hole. He wanted to figure it out. Now he thinks it was controlling him. He doesn't remember the things he saw when he visited. But he said the old Soviet was right. It wasn't empty. What he saw in there, his brain won't let him remember. I just wanted to know why all this was happening. Ben stepped in here. He said there's only one way he can think of for this site, if it can be called that. To influence a mind that way, it has to be electromagnetic emissions. It must somehow be able to read them off of us and produce them as well. It's a technique that was experimented with as a form of freaking but never with biological systems. As to why, he doesn't think there's any purpose. It's just there and does what it does. It's the anti-net. It introduces emptiness, division, and chaos instead of connection. That's just a byproduct of its existence. And its existence is a byproduct of the internet. Like angry Facebook arguments are a byproduct of the internet. It was never supposed to be something you could just navigate to. It was theoretical a thing a few computer scientists knew about. Somehow someone leaked it out there, and it first appeared buried on the Heaven's Gate website. After they committed mass suicide, it spread. Hacking sites, gothic sites, conspiracy sites, the fringe of the internet. That was a lot to take in, and I'm not sure how much of it I really believe. On top of that, apparently several hours had passed since the man made me click to the hole. During that time, I wrote and published the previous part of this story. I've read it over and over now, and it seems so odd and purposeful. The only part of it was true is that I was watching Seinfeld. And I really did dress as a bee for Halloween once. But my dad never touched a video camera in his life. Milky said I'd placed a link to the hole in that post. But he took the liberty of editing it out. There's no way to destroy the antinet. What we can do is make sure there are no more links to it out there. The thing about the internet is, it's really hard to delete anything. I suddenly remembered what the 911 operator said to me. I asked Milky, who's the captain? He was shaving when I asked him. His hand stopped moving. I saw in the mirror tears forming in his eyes. He was visibly shaking. He said, Captain Meat, it looks like a dog. Then he went back to shaving like nothing happened. Later, I thanked Ben and Milky for saving me, for risking so much, really, especially Ben, and for trying to warn me with the link to the webcam. But both of them denied ever sending that text. They asked to see it. They couldn't figure out where it came from. They checked the link to the webcam, too. It still worked. There was the front of my home, my car with the trunk still open, we watched it for a few frame updates before Ben noticed. Someone was in the trunk. It was dark and grainy, but that was definitely someone in there. And I shuddered when we all agreed that whoever that person was, they were looking right at us. We turned it off. I think I'm closer to solving this than before, and I'm not so alone now. I realize I won't be able to just relax and avoid it. And there are other victims out there, people like Angelica, 
and the other missing kids. I don't know. I don't know how much I believe in real life right now either. I woke up in the middle of the night a few nights ago. We didn't want to keep paying for the motel, so we ended up crashing with my mom. She was happy for the company, and she was obviously worried about me. She said I had to get a grip and not let my life slip away. Just solve this thing, she said. It was weird. It wasn't the sort of thing my mom would say. Anyway, I woke up, because I was hearing whispering sounds. You'd think louder sounds would wake you, but no. The whispers are the worst. I listened carefully. I tried not to move. I wanted to hear where they were coming from. It was a two-way conversation. I couldn't make out any of the content, though. Just a word here and there. I got up slowly and looked toward the corner of the room. That's where I thought the sounds were. It took a while for my eyes to adjust. When they did, I saw Milky kneeling in front of one of the electrical sockets. He'd whisper something into it, then turn his head and wait, and whispers came back. He saw my looking then and said, Some trick, huh? I guess it was ventriloquism. But why do that alone in the middle of the night? My nerves were shot. I got out of bed and went out to the kitchen for water. I could see someone standing out on the front porch through the kitchen window. Figuring Ben couldn't sleep either, I went out to ask him if Milky was really okay, because he didn't seem to be. I flicked on the outdoor light and stepped out. But it wasn't Ben out there. It was Milky again. He tried to tell me something about constellations, but I walked back in. Something wasn't making sense. There was no way he could have gotten out that fast. Some trick, huh? I went into the living room. The TV was on. It was the episode of Seinfeld where George finds a doll that looks like his mother. That made me uncomfortable. So I changed to another channel. The program guide said the Ninth Gate would be showing. I always liked that one. But instead of the Ninth Gate, it was the Ten Commandments. Very different movies. Only one number off, though. I guess it was near Easter, so it's not that odd. Seeing Heston's Moses posturing with the Egyptians struck me. I never did get to speak to Holy Moses. I let myself be distracted, chased off, or both and everything happening just seemed to be getting more and more filled with coincidences and connections that weren't adding up or added up too well, which is the same thing, if you ask me. I started up Mom's computer. It still ran Windows XP. It was Dad's computer, and she doesn't like change. I had to download my arc. As soon as I did, I connected to EFNet. This time I was going to talk to him. He wasn't hard to find. Just a hoise, and there he was, in H1991. He was the only one in there besides me. Before I could send him a message, an email notification appeared on screen. I guess Mom had it on auto start. The notification caught my eye because it said it was from date. There alt subject information requested. I shouldn't have, but since it was from the detective, I felt it had to concern my situation. I clicked on it and read. He said, as we discussed... Here is the documentation on the dental records with the doctor's signature. The attached document was about the skeletal remains found in the Egypt. I felt a sudden wave of horror because I thought I knew what was coming. Dad's bones somehow got in there. But I was wrong. They matched the skeleton up to my dental records. Mine. The detective concluded with, I don't know who that man is, but he is not your son. That was just absurd. I knew my own mother, for Pete's sake. I thought about deleting the email, but that wouldn't do any good. Then I started piecing things together, wondering if maybe I really was dead. Or maybe I was an imposter, and that's why I had memory lapses. Then I remembered I was just about to message Holy Moses. Why did something always happen when I was about to message him? I went back to IRC and sent a private message asking, Who are you? No response. I got a sudden message from U47284U telling me, Do you know where your mother is? I ignored him. I sent another message to Holy Moses. Do you know what's going on? No response. U47284U wrote, Are you sure she's okay? I took a chance on what I remembered from Angelica's story. 
I sent Holy Moses a short message, M. This immediately triggered a file transmission, which I accepted. It was a video file. It downloaded in about five minutes. If Holy Moses was as old as they claimed, this video would have taken a day or two back then. The video was called Freedom.Move. Milky came in from outside, stood a few feet away from me, and stared at me. That was unnerving enough. Then the pantry door started to open. Ben stepped out. He had to have been sitting cramped in there all that time. He also stood still and just stared at me. My mom came in from outdoors. Why was she outdoors and where? She joined Milky and Ben. What's going on? I asked. They didn't speak. I felt the tension in the air and the assurance that something would happen. The suspense and stillness was getting worse than anything they could do to me. My heart was beating so fast, and I had been hearing a dripping sound for a minute or two without paying attention. Too much was going on. Now I looked to where the sound was coming from. I saw fat beetles crawling out from Milky's sleeves, over his hands, and dropping to the floor. What is going on? I think I was so afraid I couldn't feel it anymore. Slowly, I grabbed a loose USB dongle, attached it to my phone, and to the computer. I'm surprised that old computer could read the phone, but it did. While they stared at me, I transferred the video file to my phone. I unplugged the dongle, took my phone, and ran to the bathroom where I locked myself in. I heard feet shuffle up to the door and stop there. I turned on the shower to drown out sound, and then started watching the video. The webcam being used was severely damaged by the looks of it, but I could make out a very sickly looking older man. The audio was distorted, and I had the shower running, so I had to start it over and up the volume. The man said he's been trying to warn me. The dilaton distortion in the hole allows him to send messages during brief windows. If I am listening to this, he said, I am in the hole and have been for a while. Other things are also in here. While he spoke, I kept hearing screams in the background of the recording. Some sounded closer than others. He said these things don't want me going anywhere. I need to get out before it's too late. He knows, he said, because he's me. The last thing he said before the video ended abruptly was, the birds and the bees. I couldn't leave through the door, so I pulled up the blind to leave through the bathroom window. I almost shrieked when I saw my mother's face pressed up against the window. I was trapped. I thought about pushing through anyway, but I couldn't hit my mother. I just wasn't raised that way. I could hit Ben or Milky if I had to. So I took the door. Nobody was there. That just made me worry about where they really were. I stepped outside and still nobody there. I hurried to my car before mom could come around from the back. Then I heard rapid footsteps. Ben was running right toward me from way down the street. As he got nearer, he started shouting, stop hurting me. But he didn't look in pain. He looked in a rage. I got in my car and started backing. When he got to me, he was pounding on the window, still screaming. I drove straight back to my home, leaving them all behind. The only explanation could be that I'm in the hole, whatever that means. Because there was no other way Ben and my mom would act like that. But when did that happen? What does it mean? What's real? Is any of what I'm writing really making it online? I don't understand any of it. Before I even stepped inside my home, I knew something was wrong. Waves of something, just bad, pure bad, were hitting me. I opened up. It looked normal. I started turning on all the lights, and I grabbed a knife from the kitchen drawer. Then I saw them. Two men in bee costumes sitting on my treadmill, looking at the floor, not moving, almost like they were stuffed or forgot where they were. What do you people want from me? I asked. I kept a tight grip on the knife. They stood up. Then they both looked down the hall toward my office. I followed their gaze but saw nothing down there. After a few seconds of wondering what they saw, I heard the song start. Early in the morning. While I was looking down the hall, they were already heading out the door. I decided to follow them because whatever started that music gave me a worse feeling than them. As I stepped out the door, I'm sure I heard a dog growling behind me. I followed them across the road and into the woods. I turned my phone flashlight on to be able to follow them. 
It's like they could see in the dark, the way they navigated the woods. The deeper we went, the more uneasy I became. They just seemed to keep going and going. But the deeper we went, the more I started to hear birds. I never even thought of it before, but I hadn't heard any birds for a long time. Weeks, at least. Or locusts or any normal springtime sounds. The more I followed the bees, the more I heard the birds. Until they got loud enough, I figured we must be under a massive collection of nests. I kept following them until it got too loud to bear, and then it sounded like machinery, like elevators. And then I was back in my office, sitting at my desk, slumped over my keyboard. The corner of my mouth was wet. I picked myself up. It felt like I was just waking up from a deep sleep. The room was bright with sunlight. I could hear birds chirping up a frenzy outside. My screensaver was on. When I shifted the mouse just to see what time it was, the last email from Angelica, with the instructions to get to the hole, was up. But I know time passed. I know I wasn't just sitting in my office the whole time. Someone would have noticed, called in a wellness check, something. It's been weeks. And you've been reading this over a period of weeks. This didn't just show up one day. I know what I'm supposed to think. I just don't know how to make sense of that. I sat disoriented for a while, before realizing I had to urinate, eat and drink. When I had done those things, I looked around my home for clues. The knife I'd taken was back where it belonged. My old computer was put up in its box. I called my mom to ask if she was okay. She didn't remember any of the events I mentioned, nor ever encountering any men in bee costumes. I called Day. There were alt. He said I contacted him on a lead about missing children but he was unable to substantiate my claims. I asked if there really were missing children. He said, Sir, there are always missing children, and hung up. I was at my wit's end. I sent an email to Angelica, asking her if she was alive or missing or in need of help. She replied pretty quickly. She didn't answer my questions. She said, Pretty intense, huh? You can spend the rest of your life in there. That's when I remembered the video on my phone, from Holy Moses. I checked, and it was still there. I knew I wasn't dreaming, I played it back. Here would be my evidence. The video was two minutes of distorted audio and video. In all the distortions, no recognizable sounds or images. That was a few days ago. It's taken me some time to get calibrated to reality. Nothing strange has happened since. I can't explain what happened. Maybe I had a psychotic break. I was under a lot of stress at work. Maybe someone was gaslighting the hell out of me. Maybe there really is a secret website that uses electromagnetic waves to mess with your mind. Or, you may think, maybe I'm just making everything up. A sad internet nerd in love with Usenet and gopher sites. I'm just glad it's over. I'm glad to be going back to work like a regular person. Making banana smoothies not thinking about sinister internet cafes. I really do remember the Egypt and the whole, and it's like reality all twisted. I'll just end by saying I don't think I'll be feeling any nostalgia for the old days of internet for a good long while. I'll start appreciating nature and well-ordered reality a lot more instead. Abracadabra.